gets tempest tossed. You know, that's Baptist language. Okay? Get out of the Baptist hymnal. And I understand sometimes we, you know, the words that were used when they wrote these songs, we don't talk like that anymore. But you know what? I think you get the gist. It's talking about when life throws us some hard curves, okay, and I get tossed all about, I have to stop and have to think. I don't get discouraged. I haven't lost everything. That's what that second line means. It says that I'm just going to count my blessings one by one because they are so many. You can't just say, okay, God, thank you for all my blessings. Well, I guess you can because it does take a long time. If we really stop to think about what God has done for us, it would take us forever to really name them one by one. And God wants you to be thankful for every single blessing that he gives you. And that's what we're saying. We're just saying thank you, God. We count our blessings and we're thanking you for them. Let's go into this second verse. Here we go. that you shower on us every single day. We worship you, God. We thank you. God, we most of all, we thank you for your incredible love that you have for us. Because of that love, that's we know that's where our blessings come from. It's because you love us so much. God, if you didn't, if we did not experience your love, we'd just be wouldn't much to experience at all in life. There'd be no reason for living if we did not have your love. God, we worship you. Hear these praises from a grateful heart. Each time I think of you, praise is
so much. Love you so much, Jesus. Love you so much. Love you so much, Jesus. Love you so incredible love that Jesus had for us, that he was willing to leave the most glory of all glories for us. I want you to think about the worst person in this world that you've ever heard of. Somebody on TV, a murderer or somebody. And Jesus was still willing to die for that person. amazing to you? It's, it's hard for me to wrap my, my thoughts around that. Because, you know, it's easy for us to say, well, I'm not bad like that person. But does Jesus really put any measure of sin, rank it, high or low? Or is sin, sin? And the Bible says that we were all born sinners. You know, really, it's only because of the grace of God that we're not the ones being reported on on television. Because God came in and He touched your life. And Jesus said, I did it because I love you more than you will ever know. There are no words in your English language that will ever, ever be able to say and express the love that I have for you. God says, I love you so much, I sent my only son. How many of you are parents? Would it be hard for you to say, I'm going to send my child right here, and that child's going to die for all these people that I don't know. I bet if I asked the question, how many of you could do that? We wouldn't have any hands raised on that one. And God says, I love you that much. Oh, how he loves you and me. Jesus says, Jesus gave his life. What more could he give? Is there anything more precious than what Jesus did? How many of you know that God loves you? Every day, every moment, God continually shows us why we are so loved. Let's sing this together. Just very quietly. Sing it as a prayer. Oh, how he loves you and me. I think it's wonderful when God puts it together. He puts it together really well. You know, and uh, we were, we just met them and they were applying for this job and the job was going to be based in Houston. And I said, you know what? I just rebuked that job. <laughs> I said, I believe that God's going to open a job for you up here. And he said, well, you know, that's a job in Houston. I said, no, it's a job here. And I tell you, you know, God, God will make it happen. God will make it happen. He will make it happen. Open your Bibles to Psalm chapter one. Psalm chapter 1. And I tell you, this is a good thing for all of us to remember. It's a good thing for all of us to know, to remember. How many of you are blessed today? You're blessed coming in and going out. And everything that you put your hands to do will prosper. Everything you do. The companies that you work for, the businesses where you represent their company, you bring blessings into that business. When you walk in, they're blessed. And I've watched God carve out 
those people and leave them deposited in those companies while everybody else is being laid off I've watched God keep you in your job I think it's amazing we serve an amazing God here in Psalm 1 Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the, in the way of the sinner, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But their delight, everybody say, my delight, my delight. is in the law of the Lord, and in his law will I meditate day and night. And I, everybody say, I, I, shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth my fruit in my season. My leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever I do will prosper. That's what God says you need to be saying over yourself. This is His Word spoken over you. Good things come your way. And it's not by accident. It's not by circumstance. It's because God has planned it. You're blessed because He loves you beyond your comprehension. So this morning... We have an opportunity to worship Him with our tithes and offerings. And I want to thank some of you, because some of you are stepping out in faith. You've spoken to me, you said, you know what? The Lord's really kind of, kind of challenged me to, to believe Him for the finances to be able to give. And you know what? I'm seeing it happen. I'm getting reports all the time. And you know what? That's a good thing. It's a good thing. So I want to thank the Lord, you know what, that He supplies all of our needs. Why? Because He says, whatsoever I do will prosper. Whatsoever I do shall prosper. Join hands with the person next to you and let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank You that we have an opportunity to come before You this morning to worship You. Father, we thank You for the spirit of worship that was here this morning. We thank You for our worship, worship pastor and all those that participate in bringing the service together on Sundays. Father, we worship you today, not only with our lips, but Father, we put something tangible with that. You said if we would trust you, try you, and prove you with our money, you would show us an open window that will pour out a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. So Heavenly Father, we trust you today. And so Father, it's easy for us to give to you today. And Father, we worship you with our tithes and offerings down. We do it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen and amen. If you're making out a check, make it out to Crossroads. If you're putting cash in the offering, raise your hands and the ushers will give you an offering envelope. And... I want to bring something to you that uh, we'll, we'll need to know here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, starting two weeks from today, well actually next Sunday, uh, will be our last Sunday in this current facility the way it looks today. And the reason for that is the theater has been given a huge grant, huge, multi, multi, multis of thousands of dollars. And they are going to renovate the entire building. Uh, which means that next Sunday after our service, they're going to begin to take out all the seats in this building. They're going to re-carpet everything, resurface every floor in this building. Which means the following Sunday, we are going to be in a different facility. So if I do not have your email, you may not get that. So I better have your email. If I don't, you're not getting something from me, you need to make sure that you put it on a slip and give it to one of the ushers here this morning so that you'll be aware of it. We're going to be meeting down off of Keist, uh, down the street from uh, Todd and Johnny, and down the street from uh, Brent and Bill. They'll, they'll be able to walk to church, but we're going to walk home with them afterwards for lunch. So that's what you get for living too close. But anyway, we will give you instructions. It's not been about uh, 12, 12 to 15 minutes from here. It'll be easy. It's in Oak Cliff. It's awful. It's a real nice place, and we're going to be blessed to be there and then we'll be letting you know how the building is coming they hope to be able to put us in here the following week which is 17th but I don't think that's going to happen uh, we have access to theater 2 which is downstairs which is probably where we will be they're going to do that really pretty quickly so kind of stay in tune with us and stay flexible 
but uh, you know it'll be okay because in, in a month we'll have new carpet everywhere, new flooring. It'll be wonderful. The new lobby will be there. They'll have all new lighting, a new lighting uh, grid for us uh, to take advantage of. And I will tell you, Theater 3 has made this a very gracious home for us. They love us. They want us here. They have let me know very early on that this was happening so that we wouldn't be juggled at the last minute, kind of a, jarred with the thing. But uh, so we've been making arrangements and Todd has been working on that and we're very thankful for this uh, Southwood Methodist Church that's let, letting us borrow part of their building and maybe more as we kind of go along that week. But anyway, uh, I want to thank you for being here today. I'm starting a new, oh, we're gonna let the kiddo, kiddos slip out real quick. So if you've got kiddos with you today, let them slip out. And you can be turning to the book of Daniel. Daniel is in the Old Testament. You find Ezekiel right following that is Daniel. Ezekiel's pretty big. Daniel's only about 12 chapters long. I'm starting a new series. If you've been watching on Facebook, if you're not on Facebook with us, you need to be. So that, uh, just crossroadscommunitychurch.us will get you there, I think, won't it? Crossroads Community Church Dallas will we'll, we'll show you that. And we've got pictures of the, of the band up here on the Facebook. So join us because that's where we'll also letting people know where uh, all of the locations of future services will be, that kind of a thing. But I, starting a new service series today called Standing Your Ground. Stand, Stand Your Ground. How many of you ever felt like you had to give up some ground at some point in time in your life? You gave it up. I'm here today to tell you don't ever do that again. Because the ground you give up, most of the time, you never get it back. You never get it back. So what we're going to do this morning, we're going to read uh, chapter 1. And it's not that long. It's about 20 verses. Uh, but I want to kind of make some sideline notes as we kind of go along in preparation for this. Because this series is going to be out of the book of Daniel. Last series was out of 1 John. This one's going to be out several chapters out of the book of Daniel. We're only going to cover chapter 1 today. There's a lot of meat here. So let's take a look. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judea, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And I'm reading out of the KJV, so if you're reading a little different, I'll tell you why it reads different in just a moment. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, unto his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, and he carried into the land of Shirna to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels unto the treasure house of his God. So what they've done, they've taken articles of worship, and now they're bringing them and parading them in a idol god home. And the king spake to Asenah, the master of his eunuchs. Everybody say eunuch. Three kinds of eunuchs in the Bible. Very important because your Bible, if you're not reading a KJV, does not have the word eunuch there. Three kinds of eunuchs. One, all of them deal with not having sex with women. All three of them do not have sex with women. First, there were those that were medically changed. They were castrated so that those men would serve usually the kingdom the kingdom wives, the harem of the king. So they couldn't reproduce, they wouldn't have any female male attraction. So those were medically done very savagely back then. Then there are those who gave up the right to have sex with women because they took a vow of celibacy. And the third are those kind that choose not to have sex with women. But there are three types that are listed in the Old Testament. And all three of those are still here around today. Maybe not the eunuchs that are, you know, castrated because they're working with harems. But uh, those people who have given up their life with women to have, not to have sex with them for reproduction because of the gospel or their beliefs. And then those who are like us, gay men, who do not choose to have sex with women. So there's three kinds of those here. And that's the reason why it's not in your Bible. That's the reason why. So let's take a look. Uh, and the king spake to Absida, the, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes. So there's three kinds of people here that he wants to be brought. He wants the children of Israel. He wants some of the king's children. 
seed sown other than concubine, with concubines other than the princes. They are not royalty. So there's three different kinds of people here that he wants brought in. The children of Israel, which we're going to find out here in a moment, very important. Children, verse 4, in whom was no blemish, but well-favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science, and such had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat. The king ate very well. He oftentimes ate what we would consider really fatty meats because they were flavorful. All of the abundance that you can imagine the king would have, he had. He wanted these three sets of men eating his food, the very best that he was provided, he wanted to give to them. And the king appointed them the daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine that he drank, at so nourishing them three years, that at the end they might find and stand before the king. Now among them were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto, the, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs, prince, the king, the high priest of the eunuchs, the top dog, gave names for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belshazzar, and to Hananiah Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. So, verse 8, very important. But Daniel purposed in his heart, everybody say purposed in his heart, that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. He didn't want to eat of that because he wanted to keep him in his commitment to God. And his commitment to God was that he wasn't going to eat anything that might have been served up to idols and things like that. And the king's meat usually was offered as a sacrifice and then they were using that. Verse 9, now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. Your Bible, if you're reading any other version, does not read that way. Does it have any inference of attraction there? No. Does it have any inference of any kind of, a, of male bonding there? No, it doesn't. I think it's interesting that all of the newer translations have ripped that from there. But he found favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink, for why should he see your face worse liking than the children which of your sort? Then shall, he, then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. And Daniel said to Melsar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had said over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Mishael, and Azariah, prove the servants. I beseech thee ten days. Give me ten days and let us eat pulse, vegetables, good foods, things that are grown on the ground. Eat and drink water only. Then let our countenance be looked upon before thee and the countenance of the children that eat the portion of the king's meat and then see and deal with their servants. So if we don't look better and don't look stronger and we're not better, in 10 days of this diet, we'll go on the king's meat. But give us a chance. So he consented them in this manner and proved them 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, their countenance appeared fairer and fatter. That doesn't mean plumper. It means richer in flesh than all the children which did the eat, of the, eat of the king's meat. Thus, uh, thus Melzar gave, took away the portion of the meat and wine that they drank and gave them pulse. And for these four children, God gave them. Now listen, these people have been taken captive by a ruthless king. So their life should have been ended in many ways, taken captive, and now they've been selected to go through this process where they're actually going to be in service to the government, uh, to the king. And basically what they're saying is, thumbing their nose at the king, we don't want what you have for us. We want what we want because we want to serve God. And it's kind of hard for him to think that because, you know, it could mean their heads along with the head of the eunuchs. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days that the king 
had said that he should bring them in three years. Then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king communed with them, and among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood before the they stood before the king, and in all manners of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in his realm. And Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. Very important here. Because when you start giving up ground, you lose in every way. You start compromising, and you lose. And what I'm telling you today is when you stand your ground, you've got to be willing to stand up to the commitment that you've made to God. And a lot of times I hear this over and over, and I'm, I'm sure other, the other pastors have too, that when you go and you visit somebody in the hospital, they are so ready to give their heart to God. If you'll just get me out of here, I will be a missionary anywhere you want me to go. How many have heard something like that from somebody? I will do any, I will serve you the rest of my life. I will, I will, if, 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 if. You know what? There are no ifs with God. God doesn't make deals with people. God sets his word out there and we're to follow it. So standing your ground deals with holiness and commitment to God. There was a young friend of mine who was... Uh, a nurse in a medical facility here in the city. And uh, he went about his daily job and much like, you know, in nursing facilities, people pass and this one individual passed away. And when the administrator began to go over, look over all the records, they realized that there was a very important medication that had been left off the chart and had not been given to this patient. It was coronary care heart medication not given, person died of a heart attack, what more can we say? So they didn't want the family to know that it was their fault. So they asked this young nurse if he would sign off. They would make a statement there that all the medications had been given and that he would just sign off saying that he had administered them. He said, I can't do that. I can't do that because we, we obviously didn't give them the medicine. And they looked back at him and said, here's a pen, it holds your job. You use it, you've got your job, you don't use it, you're gone. What do you do? In an economy like today, what do you do? When you're looking for a job, what do you do? Daniel faced these same kinds of decisions too. And that's the life that we're going to take a look at, at quality decisions that have to be made. To put a rest to that, he didn't sign it, he left. You have to do the right thing in order to get the right result. You can't give up ground because the moment that you start, that's a slippery slope and it just goes right on down. You cannot afford to give up ground because the enemy's watching you. Matter of fact, those tests are not coming just because you're a good person. They're coming because you have the mark of God on you. David had these same pressures. But what we're gonna talk about today is we're gonna talk about the risks the reasons and the rewards of a dedicated life. Someone who decides, you know what, I'm driving a stake in the ground and I am not going to be moved away from God. I'm not going to be moved. So let's talk about the risk of a dedicated life. Here's some of the risk. First off, the Bible's really practical. I'm going to tell you that if there is something good in your future, the devil is already planning to pull it out from under you. It's like the carpet that you stand on. He wants to disrupt you. God has only good things in store for you. How many believe that? We've talked about this this morning. God only has good things in store for you. The problem is the devil only has bad things in store for you. And the only way he can accomplish that is if you make wrong decisions. 
So we can't give up any ground along the way unless we choose to make some faulty mistakes. And I can guarantee you, as sure as you're sitting here today, there are future challenges to your faith and your commitment to God coming your way. Many of you will express them, have them happen before you get home. There will be decisions to cut off somebody on the road. To get angry with somebody because they cut you off the road. Do something, you know, and we're not talking about stealing lots of money from the IRS. We're talking about the person who I think is honest, who actually sets the, their scale to zero. That's the person who I want to trust. Some facts about Daniel are very simple. He was a prisoner of the War of Babylon. He came from a very noble family. Uh, the conquest, unfortunately, diminished any hope of future reigning by him and his country. And that's very important to know. Uh, then there was a ray of hope. King Nebuchadnezzar wanted the young Israelites traded for service. Daniel and others began training for the position of honor, power, and service. So very quickly, his hope was shifted from the direction that he thought it was going in into a direction that God wanted to go in. How many of you have ever been disappointed because you wanted to go in a direction and God wanted you to go in another direction? Ever been that way? I know I have. I thought we were going this way. Oh, and God says, no, we're going this way. And the problem with that is our will gets in the way of what God wants as an outcome. And we have to be willing to submit ourselves and have a committed relationship, much like what Ernie was talking this morning. He is our shepherd. He does lead us. And he doesn't lead us down a path of destruction. We can take the wrong path. That's our decision. And a lot of times people, well, the devil made me do that. No, you did that yourself. <laughs> so there's three things that Daniel needed to do. Daniel and his friends needed to do. Just three simple things to have a wonderful life. One, they, need to, they needed to accept the privileges that were offered. The food. Now, I can imagine that they didn't have a lot of food like that. They didn't have the rich foods. I mean, the Israelites were never that wealthy that they had lots of food running over. They were kind of living, you know, hand to fist. I mean, they were just going as they went along. And now suddenly they've got an abundance of food and abundance of wine and a great life. And who wouldn't want to be there? They needed to keep their heads down so they could keep their heads on. Just follow the rule. Don't question anything. Don't jar the ship at all. Just go with the flow. And the third thing was not to question the king's decision. And you know what? They did all three wrong. <laughs> and you would think that their life was going to be a life of hell. But it really turns out to be pretty neat, even though... He never gets out of jail. He lives in captivity 90 years of his life. So I wished we could say that Daniel has this wonderful glowing in that serving God gets you out, gets you back where you were. But God had him there for a reason. And the reason is that we can still learn from his life today, thousands of years later. That's the reason why someone whose life is non-compromising will last and their history will go with them forever. Daniel did question. He asked the chief of the eunuchs, I don't want to do this. And the, the eunuch was, what do you mean you don't want to do this? Look at what you've got offered to you. Look at the position. You are a slave and the king is giving you an opportunity to live in the palace. You've got it all coming to you. Can't do it. Can't. And it starts with the food. I, you know, that food, I, I just don't want to do that food. I would rather eat pulse. That has such a bad sound to it to begin with. I want to eat pulse. It's like beans and and stuff that grows on the ground versus having nice, rich, fatty steak like we, we could get from Morton's. Where's, where is? There he is. He's having to go to work as I say that. Brian over here at Morton's. We would want, looking at the two, what would you take? I mean, it would be so easy, that nice grilled steak. Mmm. 
making everybody's mouth water right now. You're wanting to go to lunch right now. If we get out late, you get the hot chicken. You see, because the Methodists are going to get the cold chicken that gets there at 12. We get the hot chicken because we get there later. They have to fry it more. Okay. Here's what he says to the chief of the eunuchs. I fear my lord, the king, who has signed your food, your drink, for why should he see that you're in any worse condition than the use of your own age? So you would endanger my head now with the king with your decision. So he's not just taking himself down. He's beginning to pull others with him. And that's what the eunuch didn't want. Because you see, your commitment is viewed by other people. You're being watched whether you know it or not. There are people who have heard you make those statements that you go to church and that you read your Bible and that you pray. They've heard those. And now they're watching you. And they're watching you come in late and leave early. Take a long lunch. That's not stealing, is it? I'm not taking any money from the drawer. Well, are you? Little things. It's those little bitty elements of our life that suddenly begin to weigh in so heavily. Oh, I give to God occasionally. Maybe if I have money left over, I'll give to God. All those little bitty thoughts begin to become bigger and bigger because they just, there's no end to that. That compromise, there's no end to. So Daniel made this statement and the, the king of the eunuchs, the prince of the eunuchs came back and said, so you want to have pulse. You want to have that, you know, that Campbell's vegetable soup diet. That's what you really want. Well, we'll let it go for 10 days. And if it works for 10 days, fine. If not, you're going back on the other stuff. And I think it's interesting. He was a war hero in the fact that he was able to survive terrible situation. A lot of those people were killed. When you read the story of that, of that battle, generations of people were killed. Few were selected. He, God already had his hand on him, ushering him through that because he knew the long range plan that God had for that name of Daniel. Daniel was going to be very important to the whole tribe of Israel. Now, somebody's name that comes to my mind that has a similar situation like this and I don't care if you know about politics or care about politics or about this individual's politics, but we have a war hero, John McCain, who ran for president. Like I said, it's not about politics, but it is about the man's character. He was the son of a Navy admiral. So he was already military royalty. This is what they call it in, in, in Washington, D.C. He was a true hero. Uh, he was, unfortunately, the fifth from the bottom of Annapolis graduating, but he still graduated from Annapolis. Uh, his future was really bleak, so he decided that he would volunteer for combat duty in Vietnam. Well, those of you that are not old enough to remember Vietnam don't realize what a horrific war for 10, 12 years that was. Uh, that was back in the days of the draft. The government had electives sort of over your future. And if you were drawn in a marble that day that was substituted for your birthday, all the men on that birthday went into the military. And every day they drew numbers to get enough people in the military. Well, he, his number wouldn't come up because he was the son of a military hero. So he volunteered for the Navy to be a Navy pilot in Vietnam. On his 23rd mission over Vietnam, he was shot down. And when his plane crashed, he broke both arms and a leg and had tremendous trauma to his body. He was taken captive and put in one of the worst prisons in Vietnam's history and barely had enough care to put himself back together again. So if you, if you watch him walk, or you saw, see him move, that's the reason why his arm moves a little differently. He doesn't have full use of that. And it's still a price that he paid for choosing to commit to service of our country. While he was there, the point that I'm making is, while he was there, 
the Vietnamese said, if you will just make this recording that says that you're being well taken care of so that we can put that out to the American people, we will provide for you the best medical care in this country. We will take care of you. He was in pain, both limbs broken. Leg, pain, no pain medication, being ill-treated, very little food, very little water. Open skies, rains, Vietnamese, torrential, typhoons blowing through. If you will just do this, we will take care of you. He said, I can't do that because that's not what's going on here. And I'm not going to allow a lie just because I'm, I'm uncomfortable right now. So truly, someone who is willing not to let our country down at a very vi vital, important time in the in Vietnamese war and all that that's going on with Nixon and, and Johnson and the whole bit, all of that thing that was going on was such a terrible time in our country. He said, you know what, to himself, if I let this go, it'll just be one more thing added to all that bad stuff going down. He said, no. He did make it out, which I think is interesting. But why should we even have to mention the risk of commitment? Because I guarantee you that right now, it would be really easy for, I think, most of us to say, well, I would have done the same thing. Because we're here <laughs> in an air-conditioned building with wonderful surroundings, wonderful people around us, and food just out the door, a drink of water in our, you know, right next to us. I mean, we have everything. It would be easy for me to say with no challenge made to me that I could have done the same thing. I can do the same thing. But if I were placed in that same position, would I make the same choice? I don't know. I hope I would make the right choice. But that's what we're talking about today. I'll tell you, it doesn't take war to find out what your commitment is about. Because it's not about whether or not we'll support our country. It's whether or not we will follow our God. That's where our commitment comes to. And risks are different for different people. It could be a, a commitment about your health. It might be a commitment about your income, your seniority, or your position at work. Now, all those things may be challenged. You may be asked to do something that's unethical just so that you will get that position that should have been offered to you before and you've watched everybody pass you by because you're not willing to play by the rules of the company. There are a lot of people, a lot of believers in this country today who are not willing to compromise because of the product that their company sells or the service that they provide. They're not willing to, to say, I'm, yeah, I'll sign it. I'll do whatever you need me to do. I'll say whatever you need to be say just so I can make more money. There are a lot of people that I'm sure that have done that. My question to us today is, would we do that? Would we do something that's just a little off shade just to make sure that we're well taken care of. The reasons for holiness, well, I'll tell you, each challenge that you have in your life is a preparation for the next one. And as sure as you're sitting here today, you may have thought my life has been hell and finally I'm at an even plane and I'm not going to rock the boat. I'm just going to stay right here. I can tell you it ain't going to stay like that. Because if the enemy sees you too comfortable, he's going to say, well, you know what? They're really comfortable with God. I bet I can just pull the rug just enough, shake their income just a little, have a tire go flat. I know there's one paycheck away from bankruptcy. All those kinds of things. You need to know that your God is watching too. He's watching to find out what kind of commitment you've made to him, whether it's a living one or a dying one. Each trial leads to a greater one, each challenge, preparation for future battles. Daniel kept us, Daniel helps us understand when difficult choice lessons like this one come our way, we need to remember the Lord is preparing, not abandoning us. I know a lot of times people say, well, where's God in this? Where, why, why do I have to make this choice? Why doesn't God keep me from having to make choices like this? He could. 
He could. Why doesn't he do that? Because he's preparing you. He's preparing you. If you don't know that the present trials are preparing you for future battles, then the present trials that you have will overwhelm you. I'm sure, I'm sure that the first time that those doctors told me that I had only a few months to live, I'm sure at that moment my spiritual strength, my muscle became just like it atrophied almost instantaneously when I heard that. And at the very next moment I said, I cannot afford to accept that. I cannot afford to accept her word, even though she's a brilliant oncologist, knows her stuff, been to school, accolades everywhere. She doesn't know the God that I have a commitment to.